Good afternoon. Welcome to the 24th celebration of the Lee Bennett Hopkins Poetry Award for Children. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Barbara Dewey, Dean of the University Library, for her continued support of the initiatives of the Pennsylvania Center for the Book. I'd also like to thank Anne Langley, Associate Dean, for taking us on as one of her direct reports and always giving good advice. I'd also like to acknowledge any of those in the audience who have served on any of our committees, volunteered for an event, or took part in any of the creative endeavors that we administer here. Would you please stand and be acknowledged? I know there's some of you out there, Elisa, Libby, you've helped. <laughs> Thank you. All of you have helped in the mission of the Pennsylvania Center for the Book, which is to study, honor, celebrate, and promote books, reading, libraries, and literacy in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We are successful in those efforts, mainly because of the vision of our director, Dr. Stephen Herb. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> this national award has come to represent the best poetry for children in the United States. We're indebted to, the, to Lee Bennett Hopkins as our benefactor of this important award for children's poetry. The National Lee Bennett Hopkins Award for Children's Poetry is granted annually to an anthology of poetry or a single volume poem published for children in the previous calendar year, as per copyright, by a living American poet or anthologist. Co-sponsored by Mr. Hopkins, the Penn State University Libraries, and the Pennsylvania Center for the Book, 2016 marks the 24th anniversary of this award. This year's committee chair is Christopher Lawson. He's the Youth Material Selector, Book Ops, New York Public Library, Brooklyn, Brooklyn Public Library in New York, New York. And we're very fortunate to have Christopher here to award Margarita the top prize for children's poetry this year. And I'm so thankful to Christopher for saying yes when I contacted him about sharing this committee. And I'll let him continue with the rest of the proceedings. All right. Thank you, Carla. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I had, as you can see, I wasn't the only person uh, who uh, had the honor to award Margarita this uh, fantastic award. I had an amazing, amazing committee. I could not have asked for four more um, talented and amazing um, people um, to share this experience with. Um, we had Cynthia Alanez um, from Cottonwood Creek Elementary in Coppell, Texas. We had Kwame Alexander, author, poet, and educator, and also the winner, the previous winner of the Lee Bennett Hopkins uh, Award for the crossover. Um, we also have Paul W. Hankins, uh, ELA teacher at Silver Creek High School in Floyd Knobs, Indiana, and Pamela Michael, who's the director of the Center for Environmental Literacy at St. Mary's College of California, and is also the co-founder of River of Words in Clayton, California. So whoop it up for them, everyone. <laughs> Woo! So in addition to our winner uh, for this award, the committee chose two books um, as honor winners um, in alphabetical order. Um, our first honor winner was um, Hypnotize a Tiger, poems about just about everything, uh, written and illustrated by Caleb Brown. The committee had some great words for um, this book, uh, which I'll read to you now. It's nonsense verse at its finest. Caleb Brown's work is a visual and oral treat for readers young and old. These creatively kooky yet sophisticated gems are ones that families will explore and come back to again and again. And uh, Caleb had some words that he asked to be read um, here today. He says, I am extremely honored that my book, Hypnotize a Tiger, has been recognized for this award. My poetry is meant to be fun, accessible, and full of pure nonsense. I love the process of creating it. And while play is a big part, I am also brow furrowingly serious about my craft and the challenge of finding the perfect expression of my ideas without any unnecessary line, word, or syllable. I hope that my words and art inspire kids of all ages to cultivate a love of musical language and to write poetry of their own. 
My sincere gratitude goes out to the jury, the Pennsylvania Center for the Book, and to Lee Bennett Hopkins, without whom children's poetry would not be what it is today. And yes, whoop it up for that. And as another special treat, we have two poems that um, Caleb had asked us to read today. Um, and I hope you'll enjoy them as much as the committee did. First book is The Vulture. Another lunch of dead skunk? What a stink. I need to rethink my future, thought the vulture. I'm uninspired and my soul is sick, suddenly tired of the same old shtick. The lonely nights on country roads, the hasty meals of flattened toads. This is my diet? If I died, I'd try it? Supper time is like a riot, fighting other buzzards for stinky gizzards of former lizards and field mice. A normal dinner would feel so nice, grilled asparagus and wild rice without the wretched carrion, something vegetarian. <laughs> and this is the last poem in the book, and this um, is one that the committee really especially liked. Any parting thoughts? Thank you all for reading. I hope you enjoyed my book, the artwork and wordplay. Creating it was a whirlwind, in a good way. Not to be a pest, but I'd like to suggest that every now and then, whenever you have a yen, pick up a pencil, a pen, a tablet, or a laptop at home or at a bus stop and write your own poems about just about anything or everything or nothing at all. Heed the call, fondly, Caleb Brown. And the second honor book that the committee chose was My Seneca Village by Marilyn Nelson. The committee had this to say about this book. Marilyn Nelson has crafted a poetic ode to a forgotten community that comes alive through her words. Her spare, meticulous verse is at times achingly beautiful and heartbreaking, yet ultimately hopeful and uplifting. And here are the words that Marilyn wanted us to read in her honor today. Isn't it funny how being honored makes one feel humble? So I have to say, I'm humbled that my Seneca Village has received this Lee Bennett Hopkins honor. A deep bow of thanks to the judges and to the Pennsylvania Center for the Book for their work and encouragement, and to Lee Bennett Hopkins for creating the award and for his years of writing and publishing splendid poems for young and older readers. Although I created the speakers of the poems in my Seneca Village out of names, ages, and occupations in the US census records, some historical research, and a lot of imagination. I came to feel I knew and cared about them as I wrote of their almost entirely fictive lives. I cared about them. I loved them. I hope these readers who read my book, whatever their ages or backgrounds, will grow to love them as well. I'm quite sure that if they knew you, they would love you. Marilyn Nelson. And here are two poems that she had asked us to read from her work. Conductor, Nancy Morris, widow, circa 1838. When did my knees learn how to forecast rain and my hairbrush start yielding silver curls? Of late, a short walk makes me short of breath and every day begins and ends with pain. Just yesterday I was raising my girls, now I'm alone and making friends with death. So let the railroad stop at my back door for a hot meal. What do I have to lose? The Lord has counted the hairs on my head and made a little space under my floor. All I ask of life is to be of use. There'll be a time to be careful when I'm dead. Birth is a one-way ticket to the grave. I've learned that much slowly over the years. Watching my body age, time is a thief, and what we give away is all we can save. So bring on the runaways. I know no fear. Let life have meaning if it must be brief. The second poem she asked us to read is called Miracle in the Collection Plate, Reverend Christopher Rush, 1850. Brothers and sisters, we know why we're here this evening. The sad news has traveled fast of Brother James's capture. For three years, he lived amongst us, tasting happiness. His wife and child are here with us tonight. God bless you, sister. Without a goodbye, James was handcuffed and shoved on a steamboat to Baltimore to be sold legally. Neighbors, we know that upright, decent man, James Hamlet, a loving husband, father, friend, many of us would gladly risk the fine or prison sentence if we could help him. 
My friends, all is not lost. It's not too late. We are told that Brother James must be redeemed, may be redeemed. His buyer will sell him, but we cannot wait. We need $800 to free him. 800 I know every penny counts, living from widow's might to widow's might. But with God's help, we can raise that enormous amount. Let's make a miracle in the collection plate. And I'm very, very pleased to announce that the winner of the 2016 Lee Bennett Hopkins Poetry Award goes to Margarita Engel, Two Cultures, Two Wings, a Memoir, published by Athenaeum Books for Young Readers, an imprint of Simon & Schuster Children's Publishing. The committee had this to say about Enchanted Air. Margarita Engel has perfectly captured a story that is both deeply personal and universal. The strong emotions that she is able to convey with so few words are truly astonishing. Her memoir in verse reminds us that verse can be as brief as the breath we draw in and exhale, that enchanted air is the small place between the poet and the reader. It is my great honor to give the 2016 Lee Bennett Hopkins Award to Margarita Engel. I would have to agree with Marilyn that being honored is humbling. I'm so profoundly grateful to all of you for coming here today, to Lee Bennett Hopkins for establishing and supporting this award. It's just so amazing what one individual can do for the cause of children's poetry. I'm grateful to the Pennsylvania Center for the Book and to Penn State and to all the individuals who've made my stay here already uh, so pleasant. I'm grateful to the committee and to Christopher, to every member of the committee for reading this book in the way it was intended and for understanding it. My great fear when writing it was of being misunderstood. <laughs> when I started writing about um, Cuba and my unusual childhood, way back in the early 90s, I started writing about it for adults. And it took a lot of courage because people didn't care, and people in the U.S. didn't care about Cuba, period. They had forgotten it. It was off the map. It wasn't on their cruise ship maps, and they didn't want anything to do with it and didn't want to think about it. Well, when I wrote about it for adults at that time, they didn't care about the books either. And they often didn't believe me. My childhood was unusual, and they often didn't believe me. And that hurts the most for an author. I think uh, being understood is the greatest gift. So thank you to the committee for understanding this book in the spirit of peace in which it was intended. I love what Adel Rodriguez has done with the cover art. He turned my childhood face into a peace dove. And that is the purpose of the book. I wrote this book as a plea for peace and reconciliation, which to any of you, if any of you have ever spent any time in South Florida, you know that for a Cuban American, up until these last couple of years, to say, let's have peace and reconciliation, is like coming out of a closet. It, you know, it's a secret you've kept. I grew up in California, so I could tell anybody, oh, I'm against the embargo. But the minute you step in, stepped into South Florida up until a couple of years ago, you had to keep that quiet. <laughs> it was a secret because your own relatives there would be mad at you. So. Uh, really, this book was very scary for me to write. And when I was a teenager, it was easier for a U.S. citizen to walk on the moon than to visit relatives in Cuba. So even though my childhood meant going back and forth to Cuba up until the time of the missile crisis, um, my teenage years which are included in the later part of the book, are about a complete separation 
So I often talk to Americans about the missile crisis, and they'll say how scared they were. If they're of my generation, they remember hiding under the desk at school and not knowing if the world was going to end. And then it didn't end, and they went back to you know junior high all happy, and everything was fine. Well, for me, it wasn't like that. For me, it was, it was uh, before and after that cut my family in half. I wrote this book at a time when there was no public glimmer of hope for renewed relations between my parents' homelands. My father is an American, my mother is Cuban. Of course, miraculously, during the same week when advanced review copies arrived on my doorstep, President Obama announced that a thaw in cold water hostilities would begin. In Cuba, it's known as San Obama, El Dia de San Obama, St. Obama Day, <laughs> December 17th, 2014. Uh, so my childhood memories in this memoir were instantly transformed from a plea for peace into a song of gratitude. And I rushed to rewrite the historical note at the end to take this new reality, this new possibility, uh, onto paper. With disbelief, I just was so convinced at this point that nearing the end of President Obama's second um, term of office, if it hadn't happened, it wasn't going to happen. And so this was a real lesson in optimism for me because it's something that I'd been hoping for for over 50 years. I wrote Enchanted Air in free verse for one simple reason. And I used to try to think of complicated reasons for most of my books, all these books over here, being written in verse. That there must be some, you know, scientific explanation. But as I think about it over the years, I realize that poetry makes me happy. And that I write my books in poetry because it makes me happy. And that I can write a sad story in verse and end up feeling happy. <laughs> and so even though I've cried while writing it, it, there's a very different experience. The rhythm of musical language softens the excruciating memories. I think that poetry itself contains a seed of hope. And I think that uh, Lee Bennett Hopkins' definition of poetry in the criteria for this award is one of the most beautiful poetic descriptions of poetry that I've ever seen. I hope the story of my divided childhood, though, will not just speak to other Cubans or to Latinos with our wide variety of reasons for being unable to visit our grandmothers. Uh, or cousins being able to cross, unable to cross borders for other reasons than, than political ones. It may just be a lack of money, or it may be uh, papers and so forth. But I hope that we'll, it will also speak to readers from other backgrounds and to young people who might feel like outsiders for any reason, or who might feel divided for any reason, or doubled the children uh, the gr adult children of immigrants from all over the world have told me that they share that experience of feeling like they have an invisible twin left behind in their parents' country, whether they visit it or not. So I'd like to read a poem from on page 11 called No Place on the Map. I think that when we tell our stories, we realize that all of our lives are fascinating and important, and I hope that young readers will realize that their lives are fascinating and important, and that if they, they read about each other's lives, they'll develop empathy, which is the first step towards peacemaking. This poem is called No Place on the Map. After those first soaring summers, each time we fly back to our everyday lives in California, 
One of my two selves is left behind. The girl I would be if we lived on Mommy's Island instead of Dad's continent. On maps, Cuba is crocodile shaped. But when I look at a flat paper outline, I cannot see the beautiful farm on that crocodile's belly. I can't find the palm trees or bright coral beaches where flying fish leap, gleaming like rainbows. Sometimes I feel like a rolling wave of the sea, a wave that can only belong in between the two solid shores. Sometimes I feel like a bridge or a storm. When I wrote Enchanted Air, I had no idea that both Jacqueline Woodson and Marilyn Nelson were also writing verse memoirs for young readers at the same time. Theirs both came out right before mine, which was like a relief to Mila because it will have a place on the shelf after all. Before it was like, where are librarians going to put this? They don't, they don't have a shelf for verse memoirs. Does such a thing exist? In fact, the only children's verse memoir I had ever read before was by Lee Bennett Hopkins. Perhaps this is a time in world history when childhood experiences can best be described through poetry rather than prose. Maybe that's the reason why the three of us wrote our verse memoirs at the same time independently. Poetry expresses universal emotions and softens the blow of turbulent memories without making them less intense. Poetry is a bridge between thoughts and feelings. Poetry unites us. But writing a memoir is a much more intimidating experience than writing a novel or a verse novel. Complete honesty is required. It's nonfiction. And when you really think about what that means, <laughs> but you need both factual and emotional honesty. But I wrote Enchanted Air in present tense, which is extremely unusual for any memoir. And in fact, I don't know if any other present tense memoirs exist. I don't know if it's a, if it's a logical approach. But for me, it was important because I wanted to offer a sense of time travel to the reader so that you would be right there with me having the same experience rather than listening to an old lady reminisce about her child. <laughs> uh, and I do believe that an older person's memoir can help young people realize that their lives are not the only surrealistic ones. Their families aren't the only weird ones. And their feelings aren't the only complicated ones. So Enchanted Air is both about my own bicultural childhood, but it's also about history, about the Cold War, a half century of silence between neighboring countries, and the desperate hope for an end to that silence, and that, it, that the end to the silence has now begun, and um, we hope that it will continue. The economic embargo has not, however, been lifted along with the easing of travel relation, of uh, travel limitations. But it's a, it's a big start, because when people travel and get to know each other, uh, there's hope for peace. Most of my other books are historical verse novels. The newest is this Lion Island, uh, Cuba's Warrior of Words, and it is over on the table there. This is an aspect of Cuba's history that is very little known, and it's the final volume of a kind of a, a very loosely linked cycle of books that I've written about freedom struggles in 19th century Cuba, beginning with The Poet Slave of Cuba, then The Surrender Tree, The Firefly Letters, The Lightning Dreamer, and this one, Lion Island. And Lion Island is uh, biographical about this uh, very heroic figure, Antonio Chufat. And Chufat is a, a Hispanization of the Chinese uh, surname Chufat. During the 
1840s through early 1870s, hundreds of thousands of indentured Chinese laborers were brought to Cuba and other parts of tropical Latin America wherever sugarcane was grown through a treaty between the empires of Spain and the empire of uh, China. The treaty said that China would provide labor to the sugarcane fields. The Chinese indentured laborers were housed with West African slaves and intermarried and created a new culture. And so by the time of the 18, late 1860s, 1870s, Chinese African Cuban was a unique culture. And the girl in Drum Dream Girl, if any of you know my, my picture book about the girl who broke the glass ceiling for female drummers in Cuba, she was also Chinese African Cuban. And her picture is uh, the one with the little arrow there. She was a 10-year-old girl who made it okay for girls to play drums in Cuba back in the 1930s. If you're like me, you'll be going, what, you know, <laughs> why couldn't girls play drums? It was, a, it was a tradition, it was a taboo, and she had so many sisters. The sisters had just set up their all-girl dance band. It was the first all-girl band in Cuba, and she became their drummer at the age of 10. I love to write about people like this, people who have the courage uh, at 10 years old to do something that's important to them no matter what society says. It might not sound to us in, you know, uh, less than 100 years later like playing drums is a big deal, but it would have been back then if everybody around you was saying, no, girls can't play drums. And I'm amazed at how well received this book has been by groups of girl drummers <laughs> in the United States who still say the band leaders try and save the drums for boys <laughs> to get them to join band. All of these kinds of, of people that I write about are people who have been forgotten by history. They did amazing things. These are all biographical novels about real people. I do have fictional characters mixed in, and I do imagine, just as Marilyn Nelson described, mixing the, the fictional and uh, historical characters in it. The historical events, however, are real, and sometimes they're hard to believe. The Wild Book is the most personal of these. It's inspired by my grandmother's stories about her own childhood growing up with dyslexia during a time of chaos in uh, Cuba in the early 20th century. Um, Silver People is actually the history of the digging of the Panama Canal, which is very closely related to Caribbean history because the Panama Canal was dug by hundreds of thousands of Caribbean islanders who were imported by the U.S. and then subjected to apartheid islanders primarily from the English-speaking islands, but also from the Spanish and French-speaking also. So I wanted to tell that uh, history that I feel should be better known in the U.S. Mountain Dog is about, uh, is, is inspired, it's fiction, but inspired by our own work with uh, wilderness search and rescue dogs. My husband uh, trains dogs uh, as a volunteer project to help search whenever a hiker is lost in the Sierra Nevada mountains in, near our home in California. So I like to write picture books that are just for fun too. Uh, not everything is historical and not everything is serious. Tiny Rabbit's Big Wish is a simple folk tale. When You Wander is about search and rescue dogs and Summer Birds is about a, one of the earliest women scientists. The Sky Painter is about a bird artist who should be much better known because unlike Audubon, he was the first to stop killing the birds in order to paint them. And orangutanka is about the daily life of orangutans in Borneo. Our real life search and rescue dog always reminds me that uh, work can be fun. He's a working dog. 
But if we forget to bring a, a ball when we take him for a walk, he will pick a piece of fruit off a tree and, and make it into fun. <laughs> when I talk to young people, I have to show a map because they don't ask me, where is Cuba? They ask me, what is Cuba? That's how long Cuba has been off the map. They forget, even the teachers may be so young that they forget that this is one of the United States' closest neighbors. And I'm so thrilled that, that travel has been opened up now. My mother's hometown, if you look at that map, is on the south central coast. And if that is, if you think of it as an alligator, a crocodile-shaped map, it would be on the belly of the alligator. Her, her hometown of Trinidad uh, is, to me, very beautiful. It, this is a, a modern picture, and it looks exactly like it did when my parents met. They met in the yellow building on the terrace of a, a colonial palace. My father was a, an American um, just traveling. He had seen photographs of this town in National Geographic magazine and went to the town to paint. And he met my mother on the first day there. And they fell in love at first sight without speaking the same language. So they passed pictures back and forth to get to know each other, flirted through these uh, barred windows. <laughs> and ended up married. And that's what happens if you pass pictures back and forth in class, kids. <laughs> but I, during childhood visits, I'm old enough where I was blessed with a childhood of being able to travel before Cuba fell off the American map. So I was born and raised in California, my father's hometown of Los Angeles, but we could spend the summers visiting relatives. And I not only fell in love with Cuban culture and getting to know my extended family, but also with tropical nature, so that I ended up studying botany and agronomy along with creative writing. That's my parents when they first met, and the earliest picture of me um, in Cuba, the family farm was a cattle ranch, not sugarcane. I envied my cousins who could ride horses and rope and uh, round up cattle, and all of this is in the story, in the enchanted air. It's my sister and me. By the way, if you want to stay in this home, you can. It's a bed and breakfast now. My cousin uh, has opened, two of my cousins have opened up their homes as bed and breakfasts, and you are welcome to stay there. You can go on uh, Lonely Planet and make reservations. My great grandmother with her favorite donkey, my grandmother. This is the family in my mother's childhood. I like to show this picture for a couple of reasons. One's to show uh, the diversity in every Cuban family, and one also to show the size of families. This is just a handful of the cousins, you know, at a little family gathering. Um, I would go through this picture very quickly if talking to younger uh, children because my great-grandmother is holding the world's biggest bottle of rum. <laughs> but back then, in her era, every woman had, you know, 15 or 20 children. And so my mother, when I say visiting the extended family, I mean basically visiting the town of Trinidad de Cuba, because you couldn't find anybody you weren't related to. This is an outdoor antique book fair in Havana more recently. But I wanted to show that picture in the tree. After travel was cut off, books were my refuge. And I took a book everywhere I went. My, as you can see, my sister always climbed higher. But uh, I took a book everywhere I went, in, including up a tree. Do I have time to read an, another poem? This one is on page 54, and it's called Refuge, and it basically explains how I became a writer. At a time when my family in the US had been in, um, questioned by the FBI for receiving mail and phone calls from Cuba, 
Travel hadn't been cut off yet, but it was getting ugly. The ugliness of war photos and the uncertainty of TV news joined the memory of FBI questions to make me feel like climbing into my own secret world. Books are enchanted. Books help me travel. Books help me breathe. When I climb a tree, I take a book with me. When I walk home from school, I carry my own poems inside my mind where no one else can reach the words that are entirely, completely forever mine. I hope that poem might speak to young people who may um, venture to write their own poems when they have things that uh, they need a refuge from. This is just a typical street scene in Havana. That's a mailbox there on the left, an old colonial mailbox where you would have put your messages into the mouth and it would go into the walls. Typical street scenes now, the buildings are pretty much falling apart. The fronts have been painted for high profile visits of the Pope and President Obama. Um, but the backs of the buildings, the part where people live, is still crumbling. They simply don't have the resources. Um, music is just part of uh, everything. It's so much a part of, of Cuban culture. It's on every street corner. This uh, picture of the little drum dream puppy is from a drum store. <laughs> um, that's how important music is, where there are whole stores of nothing but drums. Transportation is severely limited. Uh, the fuel shortages make it uh, difficult for people out in the countryside. This is Trinidad today. Uh, this picture was just on my last visit last year, and everybody does still rely on, on horses. I know the images of the old, the classic cars that everybody has in that, you know, 57 Chevy. Uh, that's true in Havana to some extent. A lot of people still do have the old American cars, but a lot of people get by with horses too. On my last trip, I was able to get back to tropical nature, um, bird watching, uh, the endangered Cuban parrot. And um, it was very special for me because this was after uh, the diplomatic relations had been resumed. And something about that psychologically for me, I still visited relatives too, but I no longer felt like I could only visit relatives. I felt like I could go back to my childhood love of, of nature also. And the one thing I'd like to say about uh, this resumption of diplomatic relations and uh, free travel is that it gives even though nothing has changed for the Cuban people, there, because the economic embargo has not been lifted, it hasn't made their lives easier. All it does is give them hope, and they're very joyful and, and uh, friendly to Americans and hope that it will lead to a lifting of the embargo. I would be very happy to try to answer any questions other than predicting the future. <laughs> Thank you. Yes? Who is your favorite poet? That's such a hard question to answer because it changes from day to day depending on who I'm reading. But I, I love the poets of um, 19th century Cuba, like Jose Marti, of course, is just, you know, an inspiration. I love Ruben Dario. Um, from Nicaragua. I love uh, the poets of the generation of 27 in Spain, the poets of the era of Federico García Lorca, uh, Jorge Guillén, uh, Pedro Salinas. There was a group of poets in Spain that were just phenomenal. I love Antonio Machado. And I love uh, English poets, too. And I'm, so far, I'm mentioning all adult uh, poets who wrote primarily for adults, but many of their uh, poems are known by children in Latin America because poetry in Latin America is so much more a part of daily life than it is 
in the US and people still do memorize poetry in school and they declaim it. You know, declamar, be, to declaim is to perform, you know, in, with kind of grand gestures, even out in the countryside and sometimes even people who can't read and write no memorized poems. But I do love uh, poetry in English also, of course, and Mary Oliver is one of my current uh, favorite. Uh, I find her very comforting um, because she writes about nature. And it's, it, it's, it's so important to me to find some balance between um, you know, seeking social justice and poems that you know, speak to social conditions and then kind of going outdoors and just enjoying nature too. So uh, there's th things that are rooted in, in the time period that we live in and then things that are kind of timeless and I, I really like a combination. I love haiku and tenka and all the Japanese um, poetry forms um, also. You know, I could go on and on with this question. <laughs> There's no end to this. And of course, with children's poetry, we can't even get started because there's so many that I love. So um, where do you write? And what is your writing process? Like, how do you prepare yourself? How do you manage your time? How do you manage your thoughts? I'm a morning person. It's an interesting question because so many people will say, you know, I stay up late at night and I go to a, a, a crowded Starbucks. But no, no, I would, have, I would never have written anything if I had to do that. I write only, only early mornings. I'm a morning person. I feel like as close to having just awakened uh, from dreams is ideal for me, as long as there's coffee involved. <laughs> kind of a balance between coffee and dreams. And then uh, I write by hand, pen, pen and paper, uh, outdoors in nice weather, indoors in, a, in what I think of as good writing weather, kind that keeps you indoors and <laughs> makes you disciplined. Uh, so I'm really very old fashioned. Uh, I don't come to the computer until later drafts for revisions. I feel like there's a flow between pen and paper that I lose at a computer. Once I get to the revision stage and I'm at the computer, it really feels like work. But when I'm still out there with my pen and paper, I feel like anything's possible. There, like, there, there are no uh, limits yet. <laughs> I haven't faced reality yet that this thing that somebody else might actually read this thing someday. It's just me and me and the poem, and nobody else is involved. Uh, there's no editor, no no vision of an editor yet. Uh, I write best when I imagine that I don't ever have to try and get it published, so there's no pressure. Um, I believe that a kind of peace of mind is needed for poetry. No matter how disturbing what you're writing about may be, there's still a kind of peace of mind in the process. Does that make sense? <laughs> yes. For, uh, for this one where you're writing a memoir, did you, um, I'm thinking about how did you elicit those memories? Were you looking at pictures or you just sat down and started thinking about childhood or something specific where you could start from there? You know, I think I just uh, reached an age where, uh, you know who Isabel Campoy is, another uh, children's poet? She and I were talking about this the other day, that we reach an age where you kind of um, want to write it down before you forget it. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, um, my motivation was to write a plea for peace between Cuba and the U.S., I had reached a point in my life where I thought this is not going to happen in my lifetime. I want to leave this book for future generations because someday one of them might grow up to be president and might, might declare you know, uh, an end to uh, Cold War hostilities. So it was this wonderful, I, I've never been so happy to be wrong. 
when President Obama, you know, when, when December 4, uh, 17th, 2014 came and, and it did happen in my lifetime then, um, I was just stunned and thrilled to be wrong. But I was also glad that I had written the book um, as a plea, even though it was no longer needed in the same way. It was, it, I feel like it is confirmation that, that we do need peace. And I hope that maybe future generations might read it at a time when we need peace with a different country, to, you know, as a reminder of how these, these things um, can get blown up out of proportion. It's really hard to imagine being mad at somebody for more than 50 years, right? If I ask a bunch of children, how long do people in your family stay mad after an argument, they'll go, Eh, two hours, you know. Okay, that makes sense. I could see two countries getting mad at each other for two hours or two weeks or two years, but but not for more than half a century. So um, I still I do feel like like I wrote it with that purpose. I did look at photographs, but you know, one, it was pretty much like opening a gate. Once I decided to do this, I wanted to get it over with. And I just wrote and wrote and wrote. And, um, I did show it to relatives, but I only made one small change on, based on one thing that my father said that I had remembered wrong. Surprisingly, there were lots of things that nobody could remember. Oh, what year did we live in that house? Or, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, you were little. But they couldn't tell me how, what age or how little. Or If you don't write it on the back of the photograph, I know you don't even print your photographs anymore, right? But if you didn't write it on that back of that photograph, it's gone. <laughs> Thank you so much. If you're watching this, Lee, thank you, Lee Bennett Hopkins. Thank you so much, Margarita. Your words were so beautiful, and it was wonderful to hear how this book came to be. And we're so proud that you came to Penn State and shared all of um, your work with us. And I have to say that I am very pleased to say that I was on the committee that chose Surrender Tree as an honor book. So it, it, I don't know, it just feels like I have a special connection as well to your work, having um, read the Surrender Tree and now the Enchanted Air. So just so beautiful. And we're so lucky that you were able to come. Mm -hmm. Um, we have books here on the table um, that are available for sale and signing. Uh, Margarita would be happy to sign those books. And I want to thank everyone who's here today. Um, beautiful way to spend the afternoon listening to these, listening to language and the poetry of language. Thank you so much. <laughs>